everyone! Today we're going to be reading Starstruck, The Cosmic Journey of Neil deGrasse Tyson by Kathleen Cruel and Paul Brewer. Now this is the fifth biography that we'll be reading this week. Instead of asking you a question specifically about this book, I want you to think about what you would want to include in your own biography. What things are important to you? What parts of your life have inspired you to do the things you do? Even if you're still young, you can write a biography about your life. I would love to see you leave your biography in the comments below, even if it's just two or three sentences. Let's jump into the book now. Our universe began its dance with a scientist called the Bing Bang. After many millions of years of darkness, spots of impossible brightness, stars, sizzled into shape. Some grew so massive that they exploded, spewing stardust every which way. Boom! The stardust contained what was needed to create more shapes, more patterns, the planets, our universe. Zoom forward almost 13.8 billion years to the Sky Theater at the Hayden Planetarium in New York City. On the dome ceiling, the planets and constellations created by the Big Bang pulsed against the black ink of space. Nine-year-old Neil deGrasse Tyson had never seen so many stars. After all, from his apartment in the Bronx, it looked like there were only about 12. Now above him were what seemed like millions, too many to possibly be real. Was this a hoax? A joke? He wasn't sure. When the lights came on, his thoughts began to explode. The universe called me, he said simply, and he would never be the same. So this boy here is the subject of our book. This is Neil deGrasse Tyson, and he is a scientist who studies the stars. Starstruck, Neil started looking up whenever he could. Even though he lived in an apartment building named Skyview, his view of the night sky wasn't very good. Too many bright city lights got in the way. His good friend Philip lent him a pair of binoculars. Neil used them to peer at the moonscape over the Hudson River, the glossy orb with its craters and shadows, and it all came alive, he marveled. On a family trip out of the city, away from all the lights, he was able to see more. Sure enough, the night sky really did look like the one at the Hayden Planetarium. It was real. The sheer wonder of it all, the blinding beauty, the mysteries just waiting to be solved, fascinated him. Neil was hooked. He had a whole new goal. Becoming a baseball player was out. Now he was going to be an astrophysicist, a scientist who studies the universe. Neil's parents weren't scientists, and they weren't rich, but they did everything they could to help. For his 12th birthday, they bought him a telescope. Atop the 20 stories of Skyview, he examined the night sky in all its glimmering glory. His parents also bought him every science book on sale, as he could learn about what he was looking at. Neil had one of the biggest libraries of any kid in school. His knowledge of the stars began to explode. The more Neil learned, the more he thirsted to know. But he needed a bigger, better telescope, one that cost more money than his parents could afford. Neil solved his own problem. He offered to walk his neighbor's dogs for pay. These weren't pampered city dogs with cute names like Tuffy. On rainy days, some of them even wore their own raincoats and boots. Eventually, he saved enough money to buy a five-foot-long telescope with his parents' help. So see, even as a child here, Neil deGrasse Tyson has... Um, some events in his life that were really important for his future. Neil headed back up to the roof. Sometimes people saw him up there and were afraid. What was an African-American boy doing on the roof? Was his long telescope really a rifle? Was he an armed robber? Often they called the police. Neil solved this problem too. With police, When police officers stopped by, he would offer them a view from his telescope. He showed off the stars, like powdered sugar flung against black velvet. He would point out his favorite planet, Saturn. Saturn just blew his mind. With its dozens of moons and its stunning elaborate rings, it was the most gorgeous thing he'd ever seen. The police officers would usually end up one over. It turned out Neil could make others starstruck, too. Neil loved school. He loved to learn. But not every teacher was his fan. Your son laughs too loud, one told his mom. 
On his report card, Sick complained that he was spending more time talking to friends than paying attention. But the sixth grade teacher noticed something. Every single book report he wrote had to do with astronomy. She told him about a class at the Hayden Planetarium, advanced topics in astronomy for young people. Neil took the subway to classes at the planetarium by himself. He was often the youngest person, and some information sailed right over his head. But he wouldn't quit, pushing himself to learn more and more. Neil's quest to understand the cosmos made him a young star at the planetarium. The director of education was so impressed that he invited Neil on an unbelievable journey to the coast of Northwest Africa. An ocean liner was being turned into a floating laboratory to view a total solar eclipse. 2,000 scientists and observers, including famous astronauts and science fiction writers, were making the two-week trip. At 14, his trusty, his trusty telescope in hand, Neil was the youngest scientist on board. Observing and studying the eclipse alongside expert scientists made him feel like a science superhero. Then, on the way home, he won the dance contest and the trivia contest, thanks to his knowledge of Saturn, the perfect ending to his first expedition. After passing tough tests, he made it into the Bronx High School of Science. He was a card-carrying nerd kid winning the science fair prizes and subscribing to the brainy Scientific American magazine. In the lab, he was trying not to blow things up. In his physics classes, he was getting to know the universe. His life wasn't all science. He excelled in dance, from ballet to ballroom, and was captain of the wrestling team. He even used his understanding of physics to win his matches. When he was 15, Neil got to go to a summer astronomy camp in the Mojave Desert in Southern California. Scorpions, tarantulas, and howling coyotes? No problem. This was bliss. Days were full of classes on the subjects he loved. Nights were for observing with high-powered telescopes. So far from city lights, the stars burst with more radiance and in much greater number than he'd seen since the first visit to the Hayden Planetarium. It was too inspiring for words. But with his dog walking money, he'd also bought a good camera for taking sky pictures. He used the camera to bring home the galaxies, the constellations, moons, and planets he captured on film and shared his pictures with 50 adults at his first public talk at City College of New York. Was he nervous? No. Talking about scientists was like breathing, and people liked his explosive excitement. A career in astrophysics was Neil's only goal. Many people noticed his ability and pushed him forward. Some didn't. He often had to cope with racism. Neil even had friends who thought a future as an athlete or leader in the African-American community would be better goals for Neil than becoming a scientist. But Neil had a strength burning inside, a flaming passion. He pictured it as a tank of rocket fuel, and every new discovery, like Saturn through the telescope for the first time, poured fuel into the tank. By the time he started to pick a college, his reputation in the scientific community was growing. The most famous scientist of his day, the astronomer Carl Sagan, hoped to convince Neil to come to his school. One snowy February afternoon, Neil took a bus to visit Sagan at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. They talked nonstop about science when Neil toured the labs, and then Sagan drove the high school senior through the snowbank to the bus station. In case the bus had trouble with snow and Neil needed a a place to stay, Sagan gave Neil his home phone number. Neil was touched, but he'd also heard many good things about Harvard University, and that's the school he chose. So this university that he's visiting here is actually not that far from Buffalo. It's about three hours away. In college, he stretched his muscles by wrestling, dancing, and running up and down every single path through the seats at the campus stadium. He stretched his brain by inhaling physics, mastering equations, and experimenting. And he stretched his wallet, earning money by writing, teaching, and tutoring. After 11 more years of school, he earned the highest degree possible in astrophysics. He was literally one in a million, a star. Neil kept looking up, continuing his research, solving mysteries. Then, at age 35, 
he went to work at his beloved Hayden Planetarium, the very place where his dream had started. Eventually, he rose to become its director. One day, a TV station asked him to appear as an expert. He was happy to explain the day's news about a solar flare, a small explosion on the sun. Afterward, Neil was jolted. I'd never before in my life seen an interview with a black person on television for expertise that had nothing to do with being black. He made it his mission to be visible, letting his enthusiasm explode in public. He wanted to infect others with his sense of awe and wonder at the universe, who wouldn't want to study it. As he learned more and more new things in his research, it made him giddy, wanting to grab people on the street and say, have you heard this? Then it was time for the Hayden Planetarium to update its display of the planets. Neil met with other scientists and looked at the latest discoveries, and in 2000, they made a stunning decision. Pluto, then the smallest planet, would no longer be labeled as a planet in the new solar system display. They decided it was it had but excuse me. They decided it had more in common with smaller icy objects than it did with other planets. Neil got hate mail from Pluto lovers everywhere, but he showed that the frontier of science can change as new facts get discovered. Six years later, the International Astronomical Union agreed with him. Pluto was demoted to a dwarf planet. That's actually an event that I remember. I was a child um, during this time, but when I was in school, I learned that Pluto was a planet. <coughs> Excuse me. And then I learned later on that it wasn't. Um, so that's an interesting connection. No one had quite as much fun talking about science as Neil deGrasse Tyson. He is able to summon all the social energy his earliest teachers complained about. Fascinating facts tumble out, one explosion after another. He waves his hands and snaps his fingers, laughter bubbles up, sometimes turning into a roar. Equations are awesome. The universe is hilarious. Certain equations make him misty. The sight of Saturn is simply jaw-dropping. He uses a lot of exclamations like, whoa. He has a strong opinion on just about anything scientific, from the mystery of dark matter to the silliness of zombies. I had an odd cosmic thought every day, he says. Wearing one of his many star-themed ties, he has more than a hundred. He never gets tired of appearing in public and dancing with words to describe science. He also pours energy into articles, books, tweets, and TV appearances. While Neil is rocking the world of science, he hangs on to his memory of being a small boy having his mind blown under a starry dome. Sometimes, when he's in a remote area and sees all those stars, he thinks, this looks just like the Hayden Planetarium. And when he goes outside, he looks up. I don't want to ever lose that. In life and in the universe, it's always best to keep looking up. And that is the end of our book today. One of the reasons why I like this book so much is, is because it talks a lot about his life as a child. Even as a kid, you are able to think about parts of your life that inspire you and to make goals for the future. And I really want to see that in the comments below. Next week, we'll have a new topic, but I hope you enjoyed the biographies this week. Bye now.